Hi, my name is Dr. S.M. Rodriguez. I am the director of the LGBTQ studies program at Hofstra University. On April 23rd, uh, 2020, Hofstra University hosted its seventh LGBTQ study symposium. However, for the first time, it was virtual. Co-sponsored by the Department of Sociology and Criminology program, the Center for Race, Culture, and Social Justice, Student Access Services, and the Hofstra Cultural Center, we heard 10 scholars, activists, and artists respond to the question posed by the symposium title, Deviant Past, Subversive Futures. The three panels were recorded and are offered here. Panel one was titled Queer Artistry, Performance, and Subjectivity. Panel two, Decarcerating Disability, Abolishing Gender, and Decolonizing Our Future. Panel three, Re-Envisioning Care, Nurture, and Hope for a Queer Future. Um, today, we have had a an amazing uh, um, uh, uh, event with two panels previous to this one. This is our final panel for the day. Um, and the topic is re-envisioning care, nurture, and hope for a queer future. Um, our three speakers are here and I will introduce them in order of their talks. Um, so, uh, just in case you haven't been with us for the uh, earlier panels, um, we will uh, speak uh, one after the other. And while we are speaking, you are more than welcome to ask questions using the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of the screen. You just press the icon that says Q&A and you type your question in there. It is in no way disruptive to do that. I will take those questions after all of the speakers have uh, finish their talks, and I will ask those questions for the last 20, um, uh, 20 minutes or, or, yeah, let's just say 20 minutes. <laughs> I've said 20 to 30 minutes previously, it did not work out that way. So uh, <laughs> we'll say uh, for about the last 20 minutes, our panelists will answer your questions. Um, I do want to point to uh, the LGBTQ studies um, uh, website for Hofstra University if you want more information about um, our guests for the day and after we are done for the recordings of this event, uh, you will be able to uh, connect to those links and any uh, materials that our speakers would like to share with you. Um, all right, so uh, today first we will have um, Philip of Sassnick, <laughs> um, who is from uh, philosophy at Stony Brook University, um, who will be speaking about deviant hope. Um, Philip uses uh, they them pronouns and uh, is currently a doctoral student in philosophy where uh, at Stony Brook University, where they also have completed a graduate certificate in women's and gender studies. Um, their dissertation research concerns contemporary problems in philosophy of time, such as temporal problems of subject constitution and self-knowledge, community and collective resistance, global histories and decolonial politics, and the affective temporalities of health and illness. They're also working on a long-term project on queer time. We will then have Liz Montegari, um, who is an associate professor and the graduate program director of Women's Genders and Sexuality Studies at Stony Brook University. Her research and teaching interests span feminist and queer cultural studies, transnational American studies, LGBT activist movements, the militarization of everyday life and mobility, disability, and the body. She's a co-editor of Mobile Desires, The Politics and Erotics of Mobility Justice in 2015, and the author of Familiar Perversions, The Racial, Sexual, and Economic Politics of LGBT Families uh, in 2018. Uh, I'm, yes, we will hear more about this book today, um, and so I won't spoil anything, um, but uh, her talk today is called Deviant Parents, Queerer Futures.
Uh, lastly, we'll have uh, Renyo Huang, who is in uh, the Gender uh, Studies and Critical Social Thought uh, Department at uh, Mount Holyoke College. Uh, who will be speaking on deviant queer, uh, sorry, <laughs> deviant care <laughs> for deviant futures, um, QD BIPOC, radical relationism, relationalism as mutual aid against carceral, uh, carceral care. <laughs> this is just like a tongue twister. Thank you so much for that. Um, so uh, Renyo um, is an assistant professor of gender studies um, and critical social thought. They work and teach on transformative justice, community and state accountability, feminists of color, anti-violence activism, carceral studies, and queer slash trans of color critique abolition and praxis. Their first, first book project examines carcerality and policing in Los Angeles between 1980 to 2010. All right, so for you speakers, just in case um, you'd like to share slides or anything like that, there is a share screen icon on the bottom um, that uh, should appear in, in green that you have full access to during your talks. Um, thank you so much and Phil will hear from you first. Okay, thank you. I was curious if I could, if it's possible to share a, um, a handout through Google Docs on the q and if I just put the link there? Absolutely. Okay, I, right now I don't think I can type a question in. Sorry about that. If not, it's okay. Thank <laughs> Yeah, absolutely not. <laughs> I thought that you could. I thought you had access to that. Um, That's okay. Yeah, I can check it out in the meanwhile. Or if you want to email it to me, then I can share it. Um, yes, I can do that very quickly. As an answered question. I just got that. Okay. I just did that. Thank you, Rasan. Um, so I want to say thank you to everyone who has participated today. This has been really, really interesting uh, from the first talk this morning onward, and it's been a pleasure to hear all these all these panels. Um, okay, so I want to start off by saying that I'm giving a talk on, on queer time, uh, and there are, of course, varied ways of thinking about queer time. I don't want to congeal them and deny those differences. I think that's something important. I think a lot of us would agree with that. At the same time, there are often common structures of queer temporal experience that are reflective of a world order or an ontology. And I think that Jose Esteban Munez is one of the best at looking at those and pulling those together. Um, he's also someone who is trying to encourage thinking about hope and utopia for all deviant subjects. So I find his books really empowering as theoretical descriptive tools, but also as prescriptive, practical, even survival tools and ways of enacting an appropriate future and figuring out what that is. So if he's someone I turn to as a theorist who helps understand, but also act. So this paper might be a little bit more theoretical, but with an eye toward flexibility and uh, practical application. So, I had to scrap a long section about the history of queer time as a concept in academic discourses and activist practices. Um, perhaps the most widely read book on queer time is Lee Edelman's No Future. And I'm looking at Muniz for an alternative to this. And his two monographs come before and after the publication of No Future. And he's very much in conversation with Edelman. Very briefly, Edelman, uh, Lee Edelman and Leo Bersani are the two main figures of the anti-relational school, which is founded on the contention that queerness must be isolated from the wider social matrix in which it exists and abstracted as a single category of subjectivity. So if we're going to analyze it or talk about it seriously or form some sort of ethics or politics. For example, if we're talking about sexuality, we cannot talk about class, gender, or race as well. We can only talk about sexuality. The other categories of identity or subjectivity are seen to muddy and obscure that analysis. So it's a single identity analysis and politics. Further, anti-relational theory does not consider the deep-seated series of mutually formative relations that normativity has to temporal experience more broadly. It ignores the ways in which the management of ethical, epistemic, and temporal forms of normativity in the cultural sphere 
have enduring consequences for queer lives. So in this paper, I'm looking at an alternative to this. In this first section, I want to develop a unified framework for theorizing queer time and straight time using concepts from um, Yunez, Halverson, and Elizabeth Freeman. And these were actually touched on a little bit earlier by a few different folks. Um, Elise was one person, Elise Armani, I think, was one person who talked about Freeman and Muniz together. So Freeman's concept of chrononormativity, and this I have this on the handout, uh, aims to illustrate and highlight the complementary and productive relation between one, normative models of thinking, understanding, and acting, and two, common social structures, patterns, and habits that create and impose experiences of social time. So methodological deployments of chrononormative analysis are useful for examining the constantly fluctuating forces of oppression in temporal terms, including governmental and cultural techniques of patterning and regulating experiences of time that are tied to ethical and epistemic frameworks of what uh, Muniz will call majoritarian normativity. Halberstam and Muniz argue that any theoretical approach to queer time must account for its genesis in straight time the cis-normative and heteronormative temporal modality of capitalist ontology that regulates the material practices and epistemic possibilities of gender and sexed subjectivity. So what is straight time and how should we understand it? Well, straight time refers to the dominant normative model of temporal experience regarding sexuality and gender. The paradigm of straight time is not merely one temporal framework with which queer subjects don't identify, it's the governing modality of social time concerning sexuality and gender for the world that all citizen subjects are born into. So straight time operates in the background and the foreground of lived temporal experience, often culminating in moments that attempt to draw queer subjects back onto the straight linear timeline of the majoritarian world as something other than they are. It endeavors to orient or reorient all social subjects onto a timeline that's explicitly heteronormative and cisnormative, as Muna says, straight time tells us that there's no future but the here and now of our everyday life. Expressions of straight time and enactments of straight time con constructs can be found in governmental policies, institutional practices, professional expectations, and religious norms. The enactment of straight time is continuously produced and reproduced on a microphysical level of subject formation through cultural, familial, professional, and public relations. Structures, patterns, and expectations of straight time frequently have a connection to state regulations and institutional doxa, but they're also deeply personal and often dictate the ways in which a person can understand themselves, can self-identify, or imagine and plan different ways of living. So the epistemic and ideological grounding of straight time is almost always predicated on a false naturalism, which is severely limited by its commitment to define gender and sexuality in terms of a binary logic. This pseudo-naturalistic ep epistemic regime, as well as the temporal structures and modalities of patterning social time that it upholds, is reinforced most powerfully by capitalist practices that are enacted through governmental and social institutions. At its core then, straight time works to promote and sustain majoritarian forms of normativity while actively restricting the possibility of any alternative queer experience. It presumes a neat linear auto-naturalizing temporality that attributes a fixed diachronic identity to its conceptions of sexuality and gendered subjectivity. And it provides a monolithic timeline for an individual's maturation as a gendered and sexual subject with government regulated and culturally reinforced checkpoints that foreclose alternative temporalities and possible ways of living. As Muniz calls it, it's a dead end temporality for queer subjects that continuously aims to draw people away from queerness and back onto the straight and narrow naturalistic timeline of majoritarian normativity. So I think there's lots of interesting ways to think about deviant identities here um, and how they are marked out, how, they are, how there are temporal checkpoints through family and legal institutions that enable the identification of deviance, um, process of deviance being cured or redirected onto another trajectory and other matters. Okay. So now looking at how is queer time in straight time? And turning to his account of queer time, Muniz utilizes a loose appropriation of Heidegger's concepts of thrownness and ecstatic time. Thrownness expresses the way in which our existence and self-understanding is determined by certain deeply embedded meanings and structures of social reality in the place we are born. So we're born language, 
and particular concepts and ideas that govern the design of the world. Thrownness is not something that is over and done with when we're born, but it constantly accompanies our existence. I was actually thinking um, during Alain's poetry in the first section, I was still thinking about this and I couldn't help but think of some of the things they were talking about in terms of uh, thrownness and ecstatic, and ecstatic temporality. For Muna, as the initial unfolding of queer temporal experience concerns the way in which we are thrown into a straight world when we are born and firmly placed on the linear path of straight time. We are thrown into a specific world and that thrownness is something that continues to accompany us, although we don't throw ourselves and thrownness is not in our control. And this is where queer time as ecstatic comes in. For Heidegger, there is an ecstatic happening of world entry that extends our temporal experience as something that is not entirely determined by the specific context of our thrownness. Temporality then is the primordial stepping out of oneself that makes the past, present, and future possible as particular ecstasies of temporality. The tripartite categorization of time into past, present, and future should not be thought of as a wholesale division. For Heidegger, there's no such thing as a pure past, a pure present, and a pure future. Instead, temporality, I'm sorry, temporality is not linear in essence or form and is not the accumulated total of the three ecstasies. Instead, it is a process of temporalizing in the unity of the ecstasies of past, present, and future that are logically and inextricably interrelated in one another. So Muniz, we're referring to a majoritarian world that endeavors to put us on the linear path of straight time as soon as possible. And this usually occurs during the period surrounding our birth. I had, um, I had a section where I was talking about gender reveal parties, also talking about um, uh, forced genital reassignment surgery that happened at birth as N. Fausto Sterling, details in Sex and the Body that I could talk about a bit later. Um, but part of what we get there is how, is, is how even after we enter into the ecstatic temporality where we're reconsidering the shifting relations between past, present, and future, we still have thrownness accompany us. It accompanies us, but it's not determine us. Its hegemonic temporal structures are always there accompanying us as an external framing for the possibility of queer time, if nothing else. As Sarah Ahmed once put it, I left the world of heterosexuality and became a lesbian, even though this means staying in a heterosexual world. So the strictures of straight time are alongside us in some way, but they do not determine who we are, what we can be, and how we can structure our lived temporality or the possibilities of the future. Okay. We step out of that thrownness to experience ecstatic temporality, which as I said, is a process of continuously refiguring the relations between past, present, and future. Queerness for Muniz though requires a negation of the present that is a negation of the world that orients us toward the here and now of straight time that leads us to the full ecstatic temporality of a queer future, present and past. And this is achieved in this rendering of queer negation that has several forms. I'm gonna look at the, the three forms that I list on the handout um, for the rest of this paper. So the first one is, is part of a response to the way that Muniz is, is talking about social reality in formal terms. He says, uh, so for Muna, social reality is itself performative and is constituted by world-making processes, which foregrounds a model of the subject-world relation as mutually constitutive and mutually formative. While the majoritarian socio-political order has remained dominant, it does so in a way that must be consistently reproduced. So majoritarian regimes of control are adaptive and often predicated on responsive processes of calibration that aim to preserve their seat of dominance. We can thus understand the processual character of the majoritarian sphere in performative terms. Toward the closing pages of his first book, Thus Identifications, there is a great passage where he outlines this type of ontology in terms of performativity. This is one of the quotes on the handout. He says, performativity, for instance, can also discern the role of institutions and the state as players in a performative scene, for it is not only counter public cultural workers who utilize different modes of performance but also the ideological state apparatus and other aspects of the hegemonic order that perform. So in correlation with capitalist temporal dynamics, majoritarian patterns and structures of straight time aim to preserve the present by further solidifying its extension into the future. We often see this through a coordinated rewriting of mainstream state-sanctioned state and institutionally supported narratives of its past wrongs, and by proactively foreclosing alternative ontotemporal landscapes of the future. 
So disidentification is a mode of counter counterperformative activity that relates to a wider countervailing world making process that aims to dislodge the primacy and strictures that continue to be enacted in the continuous reconstitution and attempted expansion of the majoritarian sphere. He says, quote, whiteness, heteronormativity, and misogyny are performative projects and disidentification is a counterperformativity. I think that's one of the most helpful ways of thinking about this, this first immediate negation. So disidentificatory performativity highlights the centrality and permanence of becoming to ontology. It also joins this ongoing process by subverting the processual tactics and structures of majoritarian culture to enact immediate and futural processes of queer world making. So at a most basic level, we can think of disidentificatory performativity as containing a fundamental form of negation that occurs alongside queer gestures, can also occur through activities, artistic works, texts, forms of self-fashioning and aesthetic performances that deny the identificatory protocols of majoritarian culture. The queer subject for Munez must first endure a, deni endure a denial of selfhood, which establishes a form of contradictory subjectivity sustained by the majoritarian world order. Disidentification can function as a way of untangling this form of contradictory subjectivity in a way that restores something not entirely noble about one's previously denied self. This type of negation operates as a logical necessity for queer minoritarian subjects who were thrown into a straight world. And in this sense, it is an unavoidable and necessary form of queer negation. So two more points on this first form of negation. One, that this is a form of real world making processes for Muniz, for creating real worlds and doing this. And second, that there is a certain responsive politics of repression here. So Muniz's goal is not to delineate a pluralistic theory of standpoint epistemology of minoritarian subjects, but to offer descriptions of what disidentification does within the social, while arguing that the doing that matters is nothing short of the actual making of worlds. So we're, we're, we are enacting real futures and real world scenes, worlding scenes. He thus aims to restore agential world-making capacities first and foremost to those who have been denied a world in more ways and more consistently than others. In a temporal sense, these are the minoritarian subjects who have been regularly and consistently denied, quote, the privilege or the pleasure of being a historical subject and the luxury of thinking about the future, end quote. As a primary form of negation, Disidentificatory performativity opens up new worlds that further develop something that was denied, something that did not get the chance to grow or develop, something that had to be rejected and rechanneled either knowingly or unknowingly at some point in one's past. Disidentification determinately negates the entire majoritarian history and ontology that enabled that rejection and continuously negates it within a wider realm of queer ecstatic temporality. So that's the first form. We've seen the immediate negation of the present through disidentification, but it's not yet clear how we can show the role of the past within an overall theory of queer time. And that can be profoundly challenging. Determining the appropriate role and significance of the past for a theory of queer time is one of the more affectively demanding and conceptually complex challenges for the overall project of theorizing queer time, as it requires one to engage with the deeply tragic and often violent recurrences that define such a large part of queer histories. So how does Muniz respond? Well, unlike Edelman, Muniz upholds the importance of queer histories for his theoretical foundation of queer time. He directly rejects the notion that the past is something that is over and done with. Instead, queer histories are not to be understood as individuated points on a timeline that we have surpassed, moved beyond, or appropriately subsumed into the fullness of queer time. Instead, queer pasts are themselves still unfolding as a dynamic field of temporal ecstasy that, that cannot be contained in one present moment. The meaning and importance of the past is still being explored and actively shaped alongside our continued investigation into an enactment of queer futurity. So Muniz proposed a model of queer negation that constructs or enacts queer futurity through a determinate negation of the present that is informed by the past. His rendering of queer futurity encourages us to actively engage and re-engage with queer histories to calibrate the appropriate enactment of utopian queer future in the present. So the past informs our critical negation of the present and in turn the determinate negation of the present informs the future. His move to deprioritize the significance of the present can be understood as an act of resistance 
against majoritarian ontology and the gravitational pull of straight time to the englobing totality of the here and now. I have about three pages left. It is, in other words, a commitment to resist the twofold collapse onto the present that we see in Edelman and a firm rejection of the idea that the realm of possibility can be defined only by the current majoritarian order. So it should be clear that the future is not connected to the present in a linear fashion. Instead, the future constitutes a field of difference that is qualitatively distinct from that of the present. Now that's not to say that it's void of content or epistem epistemologically unknowable in any manner or logically impossible to imagine or anticipate. So this is a really like delicate point. As we saw with disidentification, his rendering of queer negation is always a negation of the present that never operates as a fully exhaustive erasure or contentless negation. In other words, queer negation always takes a determinate form for Muniz, or at least on my interpretation of it. This means that we can identify a productive dialectical direction of each negation after identifying a specific kernel of content in the present that is expressive of what is wrong with the present onto political order. The specific negation of that which is false or unjust in the present enacts a qualitatively different futurity that is broken away from this very falsity and its presumed continuity in the present. It is in this sense that futurity is a definitively utopian negation of the present as it utilizes the falsity of the present to redefine the parameters of the future's conditions of possibility. And that's why I bring in the quote from Adorno that I think is helpful from Yunus. This rendering of a utopian future is neither prescriptive nor teleological. Those are both really important uh, things to avoid from Yunus, but imminent in that it is enacted through an attentive historical awareness that informs our determinate negation of the present for futurity. So I sometimes refer to him as a realist they're offering a realist antidote to Edelman's politics of despair in regard. He's very much engaging with history and how things unfold and how we create worlds. Okay, so the last part, pretty quickly. We have a minute or two left. Essential contention in cruising utopia is that queerness is about futurity and hope. Muniz's notions of queerness and futurity are logically and conceptually linked to Ernst Bloch's analysis of hope and utopia, all of which have particular manifestations, manifestations that are defined by an active surplus, surplus that exceeds the present moment. For both of them, this form of anticipatory surplus reflects something utopian that belongs to the future. For Muniz then, queer ideality, the surplus of queerness that would inform our understanding of how queerness and queer temporal experience could and should be understood in their own terms. For both Bloch and Muniz, the thing that contains the surplus is not known to us in its entirety, whether part of it has been concealed, underdeveloped, or denied a fully self-determinate process of emergence. The queer or utopian surplus can be identified in a variety of forms, in the form of an affective extension, an epistemic proposition, a conceptual principle, a definitional component, or a concealed characteristic. A queer surplus is itself significant in that it contains a partial component that ex expresses an anticipatory of queerness is true, fully self-determinate, and entirely unfettered definition that we cannot yet know in full. We can palpate the parameters of a utopian or queer surplus to develop a more accurate approximation of its essence, and if applicable, its likely future trajectory. Eunice's concept of queer ideality provides an approximate framing for an investigation of queer experience that can seek to understand queerness in its own terms. Queer ideality then identifies queerness as a specific strain of surplus that contains anticipatory illuminations of how queer experience can exist outside of any strictures of the more majoritarian world order. In other words, we can develop and deploy an analysis of queer ideality to better understand how queerness and queer time can exist in their own terms. I, I have myself at 21 and a half minutes. Um, there are two examples I was gonna close with. One is that can effectively illustrate how queer ideality expresses a unique temporal logic of queer negation. The one is the ideal queerness of queer, of queer failure. And the second is the there and then of queer time and futurity. I don't wanna overrun my time, so maybe we have more, more time later and people are interested, I can talk about those. Um, but I appreciate having the opportunity to present that. I think that a lot of Muniz's work is empowering and useful and adaptable. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And also connections abound to previous panels. Uh, you know, particularly I'm thinking of uh, Elise's presentation in the first panel. Um, so we'll talk about that maybe uh, during the uh, Q&A discussion. Um, Liz.
It's your turn. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seriously, thank you, SM, for the invitation and for all of the work that you have done to put this event together. Uh, I'm pretty honored to be a part of this fabulous lineup, especially because uh, that lineup includes a lot of my super smart Stony Brook colleagues. Um, and Renio, I think we met a long time ago, so it's nice to see you again. Uh, and to all of you who are online who made time in the midst of these strange and pretty scary times, thank you for carving out part of your day for us. Uh, so the talk that I'm going to give today is called Deviant Parents, Queerer Futures. And with SM's permission, I'm going to present from my old book that came out back in 2018, Familiar Perversions. Uh, I thought there is uh, some themes that came up in the book that kind of run through the book in perhaps more subtle ways that resonate quite nicely with the conference theme. And uh, the setup with some of Munoz's work uh, certainly is a nice segue here. Despite the extensive body of work on reproductive futurity and the state of queer politics in the United States, LGBTQ parenting has received remarkably little attention within recent queer studies analyses of US lesbian and gay rights organizing. Generally speaking, within this body of literature, activism that gestures toward domesticity or reproductivity is often regarded with suspicion and frequently dismissed as foreclosing any critically queer possibilities. While this work rightfully identifies the mainstream equality movement's relatively recent, highly strategic, and oftentimes deeply problematic use of LGBT parents and their children, such assessments threaten to erase a much larger history, a much longer history, of queer feminist organizing around issues of parenthood and against white, middle-class, and able-bodied relational norms. Parenthood has not had an invariably normalizing effect on queer cultures, and parenting activism has not always been wedded to an assimilatory politics. During the 1970s, lesbian mothers, and to a lesser but still significant extent, gay fathers were organizing as part of and in solidarity with racial, economic, and reproductive justice movements. Uh, at the heart of this work was a critique of the state's use of regulatory familial norms in distributing wealth, social services, and other life chances, and in policing the intimate lives of already vulnerable populations. By calling for more flexible and contextual definitions of family, lesbian and gay activists during this period saw their struggle for parental rights and recognition as part of a broader movement dedicated to resisting violent forms of state intervention and to securing the resources people need to make meaningful decisions about their bodies, about their children, and about their relationships. In my book, Familiar Perversions, I call upon this alternative genealogy of lesbian and gay parenting activism to put forth a vision, of, a vision for queer family politics for the 21st century. Rather than eschewing the family as a repressively normative institution at odds with an ethical commitment to a redistributive politics, I argue that it's actually possible to mobilize the family as a way of demanding recognition differently. That is, as a way of moving beyond identitarian calls for recognition in the forms of consumer and political rights, and instead toward broad-based calls for recognition in the form of material support support for the diverse networks of care and interdependence on which our collective and uh, on which our collective survival depends. This, I believe, is a potentially generative way of reimagining the realm of LGBTQ family politics. Yet, as I was writing this book, I found myself coming back to the same question again and again. Uh, it's a question that is certainly not unique to my interest in the politics of parenting, and I suspect it's one that plagues a lot of queer folks invested in building transformative movements. How do we keep our radically sex positive and decidedly queer politics alive in our efforts to address the increasingly urgent survival needs of the most marginalized members of our communities? What, for instance, might the struggle for family diversity look like if, and here I'll borrow the words of Amber Holliba, Janet Jacobson, and Catherine Sammy, what if we want to infuse all of our activities with queerly comprehended perceptions of desire and gender? So for the purposes of this presentation and in taking up the conference's challenge to think deviantly about the past and subversively about the future, I'd like to talk through the ways in which I tried to answer these questions in this book, Familiar Perversion. Namely, by thinking seriously about the family as a site of desire formation and by being willing to consider the impact that different family formations might have on children's affective lives and specifically on their sexual futures 
In doing so, my goal is to figure out what political possibilities become available if we embrace the reproductive potential of queerness, and if we premise our movement building on perversity's capacity for breeding more perversity. So what I've done for today's talk is I pulled this particular thread of thought from my book, a thread that runs across several chapters and spans a bunch of different contexts. As a result, this presentation ends up assembling an archive that's admittedly quite disparate, but in ways that I'm hopeful will be productive. So with my remaining time, I'm gonna do a few things. First and foremost, I'm going to walk us through a few classic queer feminist texts, as well as some more recent queer femme of color critiques. Along the way, I'm gonna take a brief detour through a bit of social science research on same-sex parenting. And I'll be bookending our journey with autobiographical pieces from two well-known feminist thinkers. My hope is that when taken together, this archival journey will not only help us in rethinking contemporary family politics, but might also inspire us to approach reproductive life in all its forms as a potential site of queer world making. To begin, I'd like to consider the unintended and often unacknowledged, at least within many leftist circles, effects of advocating for public policies organized around more expansive definitions of family. While the immediate goal of developing broader frameworks for familial recognition may be to provide more families with material support and a sense of security, one of the effects of deregulating sex, gender, and intimacy may actually be the enhancement of family settings that are conducive to what we might call, following Eve Sedgwick, gay generation. In her essay, How to Bring Your Kids Up Gay, Sedgwick plays with this language as she tries to imagine a world in which scientists might positively describe a particular hormonal balance or endocrine env environment as a gay producing circumstance. While she's certainly not advocating some sort of eugenic manufacturing of gayness, she does stress the importance of developing, quote, strong, explicit, and erotically invested, end quote, arguments as to why the world's a better place when there are more gay people in it. In other words, Sedgwick calls for a politics that is unapologetic in its affirmation of the value of queerness, of queer sex, of queer desire, of queer relationality. I'll come back to this idea in a moment, but for now I just wanted to flag this early essay as foundational in my thinking around these questions. Returning to the potential links between family diversity and sexual perversity, one of the things I'm curious about is if and how certain domestic settings or familial formations might prove especially effective in nurturing children's tendencies towards perverse fantasies and embodiments. Take, for example, Tristan Tormino's memories of spending time with her openly gay father in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Ch Massachusetts. The feminist sex educator, known for her best-selling guides to anal sex and open relationships, locates some of her most formative experiences during a summer in the mid-1980s, when at the age of 15, she lived with her dad in what is often hailed as America's gayest resort town. And her contribution to the collection Out of the Ordinary, a book of essays by children who grew up with gay, lesbian, or trans parents, Tormino recalls taking a job in a leather shop on the main drag in P-Town and spending her free time at lesbian potluck dinners and five o'clock tea dances at the famous Boat Slip Bar. She finally remembers walking down Commercial Street, holding her father's hand and quietly observing as he cruised other men. Thinking back on that summer, she attributes her power femme identity and her penchant for daddy play back to the time she spent with her father, his cross-dressing friends, and his community of lovers. While this anecdote is surely you know, dangerous fodder for the religious right, who, unlike liberals and progressives, espouse arguably queerer theories of desire and sexual identity formation, I'm far more interested in the kinds of questions a story like this might push queer scholars and activists to consider. What, for instance, can happen when children come of age in the midst of or with regular access to queer cultural formations? Doesn't it stand to reason that settings where gender and sexuality are practiced in more inventive ways could have the effect of opening up a wider and more diverse set of erotic possibilities for the next generation? In her critical exploration of queer kinship and perverse domesticities, Juana Maria Rodriguez reflects on the role that families play in teaching children, quote, the social rules and significance that govern touch eye contact, movement through space, and all other manner of seemingly mundane corporeal action, end quote. In doing so, she reminds us of the formative and potentially transformative nature of kinship relations. The intimate and often seemingly ordinary gestures of parenting, while surely not the sole force at work, play a vital role in the shaping of social and sexual subjects. 
Following Sarah Ahmed's theorization of race, inheritance, and familial bonds, Rodriguez offers proximity as a framework for understanding, quote, the acquired skills that come to us through lived exposure to certain people, social conditions, and surroundings, end quote. With the generative function of familial scenes and intimate community formations in mind, it feels necessary to entertain the ways in which sexual identities and social attachments of parents do matter and can in fact influence the affective and sexual lives of children. More than just inheriting a particular way of seeing and gesturing, children who grow up proximate to queer cultures and politics may also acquire ways of inhabiting bodies and experiencing desire that refuse the ableist and heteropatriarchal terms of liberalism and racial capitalism. In this light, parenthood can seem not, as some might fear, to signal the end of queerness, but instead to mark its new beginnings. Not surprisingly, or perhaps quite surprisingly, the social science research on same-sex parenting offers empirical data that confirms my queerly theoretical speculations about inheritance and desire formation. While it is true that supportive sociologists and psychologists have consistently interpreted their finding as indicating that a parent's sexual orientation has no bearing whatsoever on child-rearing outcomes, a closer look at the raw data suggests that researchers uh, <coughs> suggests that researchers, in taking a defensive stance against homophobic attacks, have tended to gloss over their more provocative discoveries. Judith Stacey and Timothy Biblars's meta-analysis of the social scientific findings on lesbian, gay, and bisexual parenting conducted over the course of the 1980s and 90s found that significant differences do exist in the data. According to their analysis, young adults raised by lesbian mothers, when compared to those raised by straight mothers, appear more open to a broader range of sexual possibilities, with a significantly greater proportion uh, reporting having had a homoerotic relationship or having thought they might experience homoerotic attraction. Notably, Stacey and Biblars are not at all surprised by what they discovered, especially since they were from the outset skeptical of claims about the irrelevance of sexual orientation when it comes to parents. The perpetuation of this defensive stance, they argue, requires a willful disregard for every credible theory of sexual development, including psychoanalytic, biologically deterministic, and even social constructionist perspectives, all of which would suggest that the children of lesbian, gay, or bisexual parents would manifest, manifest a somewhat higher incidence of homoerotic desire, behavior, and identity. If, as Freud theorizes, all children possess a polymorphously perverse potential, then improperly staged familial scenes coupled with access to lesbian, gay, and queer cultural formations would surely derail the developmental journey that even in ideal circumstances can only ever arrive at an approximation of sexual normalcy. But even without taking up a psychoanalytic framework, um, a social constructionist perspective on sexual development opens up space for considering the unique erotic grammars that parents and communities imprint upon children from a very young age. Different family and social settings, while not necessarily capable of altering psychic forces or physiological sensations, might enable children to develop more creative ways of interpreting and acting on their desires and to become more fluent in multiple gender and sexual languages over the course of their lifetimes. Here I actually have in mind Gail Rubin's discussion of intimacy, kinship, and the acquisition of our sexual and gender programming, which, where in an interview with Judith Butler, she draws on the work of Carol Vance to think through both the social and the psychic dimensions of desire production and identity formation. In other words, the struggle to access material support for families and all their diversity might actually double as the struggle toward a future filled with more erotic variety and greater gender variance. To be clear, I have no desire to turn all children into homosexuals, nor am I under any illusion that such an unimaginative project is even possible. In distinction, I invoke Rubin's language of erotic variety as a way of pushing past a simple hetero-homo opposition and reaching for sexual diversity in terms of fantasies, practices, and objects of desire, human or non-human alike. Similarly, my call for greater gender variance should not be misread as a demand for more transgender children. In fact, I'm much more invested in interrogating this practice of implanting medicalized notions of transness in increasingly younger bodies and effectively subjecting them to the same course of systems of gender regulation forced upon non-trans children. How might we instead imagine more creative ways of encouraging gender nonconformity and bodily self-determination among children? Queer parents can and should do better when it comes to doing sex, gender, and sexuality. 
That said, what I'm ultimately trying to get at here is I think a queer family politics needs to make two moves. First, to acknowledge the potentially perverse effects that come along with destabilizing familial norms. And second, to insist that these effects are a good thing, to make a case for the value of greater gender variance and variety and sexual variety. But, and this point is really crucial, I think, gender and sexual variation alone are not enough. To make such a claim would be to be trafficking in liberal notions of choice and fantasies of personal freedom. There's nothing inherently transgressive or transformative about queerness or gender nonconformity. Consequently, it's necessary to devise strategies for putting perversity to work in resisting the construction of the world in terms most suited to the prevailing economic system. I'm borrowing here from Janet, Jacobs, uh, Janet Jacobson's essay, Perverse Justice. In this article, she explores the radical potential of queer relationality for producing subjectivities not easily reconciled with neoliberal discourses of individualism and personal responsibility. Her interest in queer sex focuses her attention on lives organized outside the bounds of traditional family life, namely public sex cultures, lesbian networks of ex-lovers, and the buddy system developed in response to the AIDS crisis. But we can also consider the ways in which non-normative parenting arrangements might generate perverse ways of inhabiting the world and building creative and meaningful networks of interdependency. After all, becoming a parent does not necessitate a retreat from collective life into the privacy of the home. Rather, intentional family building practices, as exhausting and as complicated as they can be, can function as a way of expanding queer social formations and, in some cases, fulfilling decolonial desires and sustaining racial and ethnic communities. Take, for example, Sheree Moraga's 19, 1997 book, Waiting in the Wings, Portrait of a Queer Motherhood. In the stunning memoir, which is part diary, part essay, and part poetry, Moraga offers, quote, her own queer story of pregnancy, birth, and the first years of mothering, end quote. She writes in the prologue, it is a story of one small human being's, her son's, struggle for survival, for life, in the age of death, in the age of AIDS. While the second half of the book focuses on her son's long hospital stay following his premature birth, the first half looks back on her decision to have a child and reflects on the process of making queer familia with her white femme lover and her gay Chicano comadre who started out as a sperm donor and ended up quite unexpectedly as a kind of father to her son. Thinking back on her decision to become pregnant, she chronicles the deaths of her friends who had lived on the margins of respectability, men of color, some of whom identified as gay, who had contracted HIV, and women of color, many of whom identified as lesbians who had developed cancer. And she wonders if there might have been a queer balance to the birthing and dying that marked this period during the early 1990s. Parenthood for Morago is not a heterosexual imperative, but a way of fighting back against histories and presence of genocidal violences and reaching toward more just futures. Moreover, as her meditation on making familias suggests, the radical potential of queer parenting lay in the hope of raising children who won't imagine their lives as already scripted by white middle-class familial norms, but will see themselves embedded in rich histories and entangled with beautifully messy community formations. The strengthening of a queerer and more diverse array of families with children, families that might do gender differently, that might span multiple generations or multiple households, and that might provide models for single parenting, polyamorous parenting relationships, or co parenting agreements among exes or friends. These could potentially interrupt the reproduction of privatized family desires. A queer family politics could approach the work of raising children as a site for radical intervention, for instilling an anti-capitalist ethical vision in the next generation, and for inciting perverse desires and embodiments that could lay the affective groundwork for assembling intimate socialities at odds with the forms of subjectivity and relationality on which racial capitalism and US imperial interests depend. To destabilize the primacy of the nuclear family is to resist through seemingly mundane gestures, neoliberalism's annihilation of collectivity and mutual responsibility. The work parents do intentionally or not to encourage young people to imagine family in more flexible and contextual ways and to expect that their networks of love and care and passion will shift and vary in size and scale over the course of their lifetimes has the potential not only to incite more opportunities for erotic exploration, but also to inspire a reconceptualization of ethical obligations. It would thus be a mistake 
and I'm closing up here. It would thus be a mistake for scholars or activists to assume that a more transformative approach to queer organizing must necessarily distance itself from procreation and child rearing and excise any familial language from its vision for the future. In contrast, the queer family politics I'm imagining would insist on the value of queer social formations at their most intimate levels and imagine strategies for maximizing the perversely reproductive potential residing within queer ways of life. The work of challenging white, abled, and middle-class relational norms might enable a more equitable availability of wealth and resources, but this redistribution of life chances still takes place according to the terms of capital and in line with its exploitative modes of domination. If, however, we insist on the fact of relationality in all its perversity and on our lived interdependencies, which defy the normative rules of kinship, then our organizing efforts might hold out more transformative possibilities. To actively cultivate creative and expansive modes of kinship may prove an effective strategy for dislodging marital family norms and for unsettling the very foundations of racial capitalism and the imperial sexual and social order. To this end, the queer family project of trying to transform our material and discursive conditions aims not just to sustain, but crucially to spawn and to strengthen more perverse ways of being, desiring, and making family. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, ben Yo, uh, bring it home. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, great. I, I hope my Wi-Fi is working well. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say thank you for, for those of who've been plugging in or tuning in the whole day, and um, that it's been such a beautifully curated discussion um, and it, I feel really fortunate to kind of be a part of this and um, uh, I wanted to thank you SM for what was supposed to be an in-person kind of convening um, that now I think it's the last thing people have been thinking about is doing programming so and so I just want to thank you for continuing to kind of have the vision to have us come together um, virtually um, and the other panelists um, Liz mentioned, um, actually, I think it was over a decade ago, one of my early graduate conferences or first ones was at UC Davis that Liz was organizing as an outgoing graduate student. So that's a, it's a nice full circle to be on this panel with you. Yeah. Um, I wanted to say there might be some noise in the background that sounds like barking because it is, there's multiple dogs around. <laughs> um, and what um, I wanted to mention that um, uh, that I'm going to be reading for an article that was published from NTSQ in their Trans Futures. Um, uh, it was a special issue that came out in November. Jian Chen and Misha Cardenas were the editors. Um, it's um, I'm going to try to share some slides so you can follow, um, but I just wanted to kind of mention um, that I will try to read a little bit, break down some of the concepts that I think are useful um, for kind of an audience, um, a virtual audience of kind of uh, across different fields and um, uh, studies and, and kind of spaces of thinking. Um, and then I'll read a little bit more. And if there is time, I might show uh, some clips from this um, it's very rough cut uh, documentary that has to do with one of the people I write about um, when we went to go um, pick her up when she was released last April. So she had her her uh, release anniversary. This is for someone, a trans woman of color who was um, inside for many years. So I'll explain a little bit more of that in a second. So let me try to do the screen share. And forgive me, I'm still teaching right now, <laughs> three classes. So um, it's a it's been a bit of like throw the slides together. So um, not necessarily my aesthetic, but it's just what I was, it's like the limit of my, <laughs> my like technological capacity, but um, I did my best. Okay, let's see if this works. Um, can you all see what I'm, I have here? Okay, great. And then again, SM and anyone else, please feel free to unmute if, if there's anything about accessibility in terms of readability or how I'm speaking or my connection. Um, 
Um, okay, great. Let me see if I can move my thing so that I can see. Oh, Zoom is so weird. Okay, <laughs> there, I think that's a little bit better. So you all can see the full slide. I'm seeing a nod. Okay, cool, thanks. Oh gosh, okay. All right, let's see. Huh. All right, maybe that. Okay, so it's online, so you could read it to your heart's content. It's um, open source right now. Duke put together a really fun care and in certain times syllabus. Um, Dean Spade's normal life is entirely on there. There's quite, there's um, a new social text um, uh, special issue that came out about radical care that um, is really great. That's all available there. So I just thought I'd mention it in case people wanted access to that and I'll send the links to SM as well after. Um, I just wanted to say I had permission to share the stories obviously. Um, uh, with Aaliyah and the other women inside, I write the the title of the um, the articles, Deviant Care and Deviant Futures, and just generally, I'm thinking through how um, kind of mutual aid, and and I'll acknowledge a little bit of the context we're in and how that's being used, um, and is a a model for thinking about queer, trans, Black, and Indigenous centered. POC, um, radical relationalism, as I call it, um, and I'm borrowing from other indigenous and black feminists, um, both theory and activism. And I use deviant care to try to um, displace what has been kind of a progressive reform of thinking about um, uh, um, prison and criminal justice reform through um, uh, carceral care, as I name it. And so I'll get into that in a second, but I just wanted to leave this up here for a second. Um, so um, one of the main sites I just wanted to, I'll start reading, but, um, but this is um, one of the aerial shots of um, Corcoran um, State Prison. There's two facilities um, that I'll mention. Um, okay, uh, I only say this now with a bit of like, pain in my heart. I, while this conference was happening, I got a call from one of the folks inside I work with and they're moving people from this facility that you see here to the Corcoran, which is the older facility next door, because they're trying to space them out. Um, but you can imagine the kind of extreme upheaval and um, misplacement of people. So one of the trans women is going to be placed on this yard with other only trans, I'm sorry, with only um, cis men, and so there's just um, a lot of issues with um, the kind of relocation that's happening now due to COVID. Um, but at this men's designated public prison, men's prison, um, they have a special needs yard where unofficially um, there's around 30 to 35 trans women that are placed um, in CSATF. Okay, so. Um, Traveling north on Interstate 5, this is back in March of 2017, I departed Koreatown, Los Angeles's smoggy, low-lying landscape of strip malls punctuated only by high-rise luxury condominiums. From urban sprawl to stretches of yellow-brown agricultural fields, this three-hour drive brought me to the doorsteps of the prison town Corcoran, California, or Tachiyuka tribal territory of Kings County. Historically known for its agricultural industrialization of cotton, wheat, alfalfa, Corcoran is now anchored by two public prisons I just mentioned, um, California State Prison, it's Corcoran, in, established in 1988, Ruthie Gilmore, of course, and Golden Gulag kind of does the um, explanation of this further of how um, the prison built up in the 80s. And then CSATF, which you see before you, um, which was built about a decade later. Um, euphemistically called substance abuse treatment facility. Um, very little treatment um, or, or actual kind of care in, in the sense of how we understand um, um, working with, even with the kind of, um, I think, language of substance abuse treatment facility, um, kind of the, the knowingness of it just being a second prison in Corcoran. If anything, um, 
there's some literature about how a lot of the language in the 90s during the prison buildup was around um, being able to use um, different kind of funding streams that were about um, um, treatment for um, uh, substance and drug use. So, so um, in 2017, about just some stats, 43% of the town's 22,000 residents were caged in the two facilities. Um, both CSP, CSATF employ roughly a third of Corcoran's non-incarcerated residents, right? So very intergenerational kind of working within the prisons. Um, uh, additionally, it's the leading employer in the county. Um, so um, I, I set the stage, right, to kind of talk about how the ways in which, and I, so this is me reading again, the colonial romance with fertile, expansive, unworked land, right, as I mentioned, of Corcoran, and the fungibility of captive bodies has provided, to borrow from Sadia Hartman, the very stage of sufferance through the ages. Tracing a path from chattel slavery on plantation fields to convict lease labor, of corporate and private plantations, slavery to prison history is evidenced by slave quarters turned prison farms. Corcoran stands as an exemplary model of the prison fix. What Gilmore troubles is not simply an economic rationale, rural agricultural towns turned prison towns, but also the promise of domestic and militarized manifest destiny. A welfare to warfare state of surplus land as a rationale for surplus populations and vice versa. Let me turn to the next slide. So um, I tried to break down a little bit of where I imagine carceral care falls in this, and it's way oversimplified purposefully to make an argument, but um, this, this kind of um, historical trajectory of penal reform, as I call it. So one may argue um, that it exists in a progression from the sovereign powers carceral exile, so chattel slavery to capital punishment, to a moan of carceral cure, deviant bodies as the symbolic rationalization for expanding institutional punishment, um, a logical outcome of a moral civil society. So obviously, Liette Van Moshi's um, uh, earlier um, reading of thinking about how um, mental illness, um, madness, and so forth had become um, criminalized over time. And I would say in this current moment of kind of progressive um, carceral progression or progressive reform, I think that's Judith Shep's um, um, language, a logical outcome, oh, sorry, carceral care, which I'm looking at, which is the liberal humanistic concern for the improved treatment of those incarcerated, right? So this kind of moment in which we're finding these tensions within abolitionist strategies to think about what are the kind of necessary calls right to being able or even moves right to to being able to get our people out um, and to ab abolish these spaces of carcerality um, i'm going to um, skip to the next slide here <clears throat> okay um, so when i say carceral care right i'm i'm how I describe it as the messy and tangled conglomerate of discretionary practices, performative measures, material actions um, that are actually used to forestall the possibility of future interference or interrogation of the underlying institutional violences of carceral spaces, right? So there's a way in which I think different kinds of reform measures, even, even upon implementation, right? Or even if it's a, this happens a lot with, I think, folks who um, work with people inside. They'll say this one correctional officer, CO, you know, is a little bit better than this other one, right? Or we know to to kind of like file our 602 forms, right, around complaints to this person because he'll actually or she will actually do something about it, right? So it's almost as if it's and it's a notion of care, right, that people experience um, in doing this. But more than anything, it's often used as a kind of very internalized mode of um, accountability to some degree, right? That isn't about actually um, uh, disrupting kind of the form and function of the prison itself. So um, I'm reading again, sorry. Similarly, carceral care is not simply the deterrence, reduction, or interruption of carceral violence. Rather, it is a mode of tracing how the penal administration 
of care multiplies the very scales, technologies, and cultural structures of violence itself, right? Um, disrupting those very impulses to be trapped by the rigged gamble that is carceral care requires us, those who have any distrust in the possibility of life-giving care in such death-dealing space, making spaces, to inhabit a deviant set of relationships, not only to the state, um, but also to one another. And I think it's interesting when I'm thinking about the title of the symposium, um, it's a deviant past subversive futures, I believe, SM, right? And so um, I was thinking through how I understood deviance um, in, in kind of the Latin root word of um, kind of turning out of the way to deviate from, and whereas subversion sometimes is about, or the root of the word is about the kind of overthrowing or turning over, right? And there's something about deviance that I'm, I'm, I've been thinking about as why that term, right, that felt useful for me to kind of um, spend time um, unpacking um, was um, because of its potential to kind of um, do a kind of, and, and I think this pulls on the first um, um, paper from our group, um, the kind of otherwising, right, that Munoz offers, right, that isn't necessarily just about the kind of visible counter hegemonic, um, but the possibility for the things that are sometimes not as visible or notable in terms of the, the ways um, we can, can re-vision what care could mean. Okay, so um, I'm trying to be mindful of my, I have a timer with me just in case. Okay, so um, I ask how might we resist and build our collective capacity to continuously trouble these notions of care, right? when so much of it is kind of rooted in the carceral and I try to do a bit of that work, I won't be able to lay it all out here, but how might we resist both the inferred and overt modes of racialized and gendered pathologies of individuated care that requires the weaponization of personhood, right? And I'm, I'm pulling from Eli Clare here, um, disability, um, justice activist, theorist, writer, poet, so forth. Um, how might we account for the dualisms embedded within care? So things that, and cure for that matter, success, failure, curable, incurable, rehabilitated or recidivistic, right? So care, even in its etymological tie to cure, um, and there's, uh, that's, that's where care kind of is rooted in, right? Um, is not necessarily carceral. However, the attendant logics of care mimic a curative, I have a slide for this, right? Mimic a curative model of carcerality by requiring, here we go, <laughs> requiring, so you can follow along, um, individuated pathologies as central to administrative measures of correction. Okay. So I'm gonna skip some sections in which I do some kind of collaborative ethnography about um, visiting and supporting Aaliyah, who's the main person I'm, I'm describing in the, in the, um, in thinking through what this kind of deviant care and mutual aid looks like. So I'm gonna to move to the next slide. So um, I'm gonna to move to a section in which, because it's appropriate for this symposium too, in thinking about deviance um, as mutual aid. Um, so the study of deviance um, as a fixture of the social sciences found its root in early 19th century humanistic endeavors that sought to streamline the philosophy of science as positivism and self-evidently true. To this day, sociological studies ranging from human behavior to criminology continue to be preoccupied with two general abstractions worth troubling. First, the observation that any particular human trait can be deduced, extracted, applied to forge a universal claim concerning particular subjects, that is the permanent prefiguration of the deviant or the criminal, right? So this, logical, this logic assumes that the social or legal norms are unchanging, and second, that such positivistic empirical studies of deviance fail to acknowledge the genocidal colonial processes by which regulatory techno technologies of law, legal enforcement, and juridical discourses are normalized and naturalized. Thus, the reproduction of the figure of the deviant as criminal and vice versa only normalize a pernicious cycle, sorry, a pernicious cycle 
of expansion, reform, and research on carceral technologies, carceral spaces, ranging from the ethics of solitary confinement, mental health jails, youth and detention centers, to debates on gender responsive imprisonment. So I mentioned these as kind of a mode in which when still deviancy is still rooted so much in how um, even kind of the reform against deviancy, right, still kind of reroutes the questions to be centered around how do we make it more ethical solitary confinement, right, or the youth jail, so forth. So how do we get out of that kind of framing, right? Um, so I, let me see the next slide here, right? So I actually turned to kind of black feminist interventions such as Kathy Cohen and Sarah Haley um, and other folks to think about how um, uh, black feminist traditions, politics um, and activism have kind of pushed us to think about um, how um, we might imagine deviants and deviant practices as actually rooted in that genealogy, right? Um, and as a mode of kind of um, pushing against a social political ordering of respectability, right? And so I do that in order to offer um, the space to think through this point of passage to borrow from Haley, um, the conditions of radical deviance as one that dislodges regulatory norms, devices that naturalize the juridical world of law, order, crime, punishment as an anti-Black and heteropatriarchal precept. Um, okay, how am I doing on time? Maybe like five minutes or less, SM? Uh, you could certainly take five more minutes. Okay, sure. Um, so I will turn to, um, so mutual aid, I think I mentioned again, um, Dean Spade's recent article that was just published in Social Text. So there's also a great um, video you can find on both Big, Bo Big Door Brigade, um, as well as um, I think um, Spade's website as well. It's a great like seven, eight minute kind of um, stop motion um, animation um, that kind of breaks down this idea of solidarity and not charity, right? And anti-hierarchical social relations of material care. And I mentioned that in this moment of COVID when we're seeing kind of a co-optation of the term um, to kind of do a very, um, I think one of the um, earlier presenters was using flattening, which was, I thought was had such explanatory power, but this very flattening and depoliticization of the term, right? When we're thinking about how it's actually anti-capitalist mode of kind of um, de-individualization um, and pushing back against kind of a need-based competition. And there's like a funny thing that's happening in this moment where um, even I, I was on a, um, this QT BIPOC mutual aid fundraiser group that we're, we've been doing, um, a group of us, and we're noting how even different government websites like city and um, city and county websites have been putting like mutual aid funds in their resources right and it just shows this kind of devastating way in which this like whatever is left of this welfare state has you know now is trying to mimic or take credit for the work that's happening on the ground so there's just an interesting thing there um so i'm going to skip the slide for time i i go into kind of breaking down how do we kind of how do we see this mutual aid and and deviant kind of care against carceral feminism and carceral humanism and again i'll, I'll share these slides um, with sm if you want to take a closer look at those um, but what i wanted to just mention right isn't so at the end of the article um, i turned to and this is um, the tieps memo that came out in 2018 it was considered kind of a win by transgender kind of um, organizing groups in California um, uh, because of their work on being able to get um, quote unquote female de designated items into the prison. Um, and so I worked with some of the women at CSATF to ensure that they could get these basic kind of survival um, uh, um, um, items that one might consider as being kind of excesses of um, what actually someone needs to survive. So things such as um, cosmetics um, and and um, feminine items of clothing 
Um, but the what I found really interesting and in kind of focusing, and then I could have done a closer read, but I, um, I'll turn to the next page here too. As you can see, they have the male designated on the left and the right. So for trans women on my left and trans men on the right. Um, but these packages um, were actually one mode in which um, I use and as an example of how um, uh, the women inside practice kind of um, deviant care and mutual aid with one another, right, in terms of sharing even their packages that are supposed to be tightly individuated, right, and this is the same scenario of how, for instance, right now, there's a lot of funding that we're trying to redistribute to folks as commissary inside as well. And um, there's, we've had to become really clever and um, creative about how to make sure then people are getting the full amount of fees. I don't want to say too much, right? Also being mindful of how this is kind of an ongoing thing that we're trying to make ensure can happen. Um, but in the end, um, I describe and and I'll read a little bit and then close out. But um, deviant care demands an inhabitation of a radical relationalism that critically upends impulses to simply be against rules, regulations, and norms. Queer um, as a subjectless critique only feeds the white supremacist political veracity to simply drop in, detach from, or extract otherness as an exercise in peculiar, particular critical inquiry. Such absolutionism and purity of ab ab abolitionist praxis, and I'm referring to some of the debates on what is considered a real abolitionist strategy when trying to exercise care within these carceral care and care kind of ab reforms within these um, institutions. So um, such absolutionism and purity of abolitionist practice only um, as only ever that which fully is against or outside reformist strategies are often that's my own alarm, <laughs> are often suspect postures of more radical than thou. In other words, how might we deviate and disrupt our reliance on seemingly inevitable futurity of surplus populations while engaging with a politics of relationalism that deals with in the then and now the legacies of cyclic, what cyc such cyclical prefigurations? whether it's the deviant, the criminal, the inmate, the terrorist, the illegal, the black identity, extremists, so forth. Um, how might we, how might radical relationalism beyond a sociological epistemology of the radical relational offer a new mode of temporality in relationship to our present future? So QTPOC radical relationalism exists beyond a reductive dichotomy of success and failure, yet it centers the emotional and intending to collective politic of care. What then might be a deviant present future reveal concerning the ongoing reverberations of a living, breathing, and bleeding colonial curative temporality? Um, so I'll stop there. Um, and so thank you for your time. I hope some of that was easy to follow in some ways. Um, yeah, let me do my screen. Thank you so much. And yes, I think um, the visuals, you know, certainly helped uh, in that case, particularly with those uh, uh, snapshots that you had with the um, one, the, the, the site in and of itself, but then also uh, the types of goods that might be needed um, and yet denied. Um, you know, so we have, we have two questions from the audience I do want to uh, make sure that we get to, and we have about 11 minutes for our Q&A, so um, it's actually okay that we're not flooded with too many questions right now that we wouldn't be able to get to. Um, but before that, I do want to kind of just make note that um, there were so many ways <laughs> that this um, symposium could have been configured uh, because these connections, I mean, obviously there's a thread throughout. And, you know, so I do want to acknowledge that. And I also want to say thank you uh, to the three of you for, for uh, the ways that your work not only speaks to um, uh, you know each other but to this larger kind of moment where we need uh, 
critique and questioning um, in order to have this, I guess, this thread of reverberation. Thank you, Elise Armani, who uh, <laughs> did that echo work earlier. Um, but, uh, you know, particularly as we see, like, uh, Phil, Phil, you, you know, speak um, so clearly and so wonderfully about the time and our, uh, you know, what temporality means. And I think this ecstatic temporality um, uh, being such a, a crucial concept uh, when we think about queer time. And so I, I love that. And I, I just want to kind of elevate, um, you know, this tension that you were bringing out with how the past informs uh, the negations of the present, right, which then inform uh, our negations that create a future um, and what queer utopia means in terms of uh, uh, thinking through these, uh, thinking in a future tense um, in this moment and kind of creating that. Um, I think that that set such a wonderful stage even for um, what Liz gave us uh, in thinking through uh, the same kind of uh, tensions or similar tensions with um, temporality, but particularly through um, the way, I think in your critique of social sciences, <laughs> uh, um, um, you know, where you spoke about the liberal readings um, that are kind of born from uh, conservative politic of the day, but also reflect their own conservatism um, in the way that they ultimately limit um, abundance and creativity and uh, uh, generation and what uh, or what you describe as erotic variety as well um, within your work. And so, um, you know, I just want to emphasize that these connections um, to me were so. Um, let's say fertile, uh, um, within uh, the three of yours, particularly then moving into Renyo. Um, I think that you kind of leverage a similar critique there when you talk about the um, ways that uh, life-giving reforms, right, um, or, or life-supporting and affirming reforms uh, within um, the uh, carceral sites, um, are often critiqued as not real abolition, um, right? Even though we see this work uh, that's coming up within uh, groups that are incarcerated, particularly trans women uh, who are incarcerated, who are making sure to do this radical work that is, well, life-giving. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I love that. And I also am thinking back to the last panel where Kai was speaking about, um, Oh, oh, the matrices, various matrices of care. Uh, so all to say, these are all speaking to each other in, in such wonderful ways. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to bring out these two questions. Uh, or actually, okay, yeah. So these are, are both for Liz. Um, so the first one says, um, congratulations. It's a wonderful event and great talk. Uh, Liz, this was as you were speaking. I'm interested in reading your book. I live in Ecuador, um, South America. And then it says, yes, Liz, it's me, Santiago. Uh, <laughs> is it available as an ebook or through Kindle? Um, saludos desde Quito. Um, so, yes, it is available as ebook. Hi, Santi. It's good to see you. Um, yes, it's available as an ebook. It's available on Kindle. And also just email me. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So send, send Liz an email. Um, and also, I will make sure, if I didn't do that before, to link um, the available forms uh, through the website. Um, there is a question from Mijin that says, for Liz, I really appreciate your presentation pushing us to think about a queer family movement that is decolonial and interdependent. I'm curious if you've thought about origins of the children of queers whose futures you're imagining. Many queers rely on sperm donors, international and domestic adoptions, which is often exploitative. Women of color, poor people, young mothers whose children and sperm are used and taken from them in order to serve couples who desire a quote unquote child of their own. I'm curious how you think about these origin stories in your work as children simultaneously are seen as, quote unquote, the future. 
Oh, I didn't realize I had not remuted. Uh, this is a great question, um, if only because it speaks to what my book is about. Um, so I feel uh, in some ways my answer can be, you too should access the Kindle, a version of my book. But more seriously, um, Familiar Perversions is first and foremost a critique of the rights-based frameworks that have tended to define uh, LGBT activism in the United States um, and beyond, but my focus is it's an American studies project. Um, and to kind of really tease out the limits of uh, inclusionary politics that ultimately expand uh, the legal systems, uh, the military systems that uh, are so incredibly oppressive and repressive and violent. Uh, so the book looks at the basically the first 20 years of, or kind of late 90s into the end of the Obama administration. So from a kind of counter-terrorist era, Bush one moment where uh, anti- gay parenting rhetoric was at the national level to the moment where marriage equality uh, becomes the thing that happens. And I try to ask, you know, how do we go from there to there? And really what was one along the way? This is allegedly a progressive, uh, a progressive trajectory. And yet we see um, only a further expansions of immigration detention, expansions of prison systems, expansions of policing. Um, so who, who won here? So I say all of that to say that the, the book itself really tries to make sense of the embeddedness of LGBT family building practices within precisely the kind of um, systems that, that this question flagged. So the book talks about the, the, the problematic um, forms that the surrogacy industry has taken, the global surrogacy industry, the unregulated circulation of eggs, sperm, and other reproductive materials, um, the reliance of uh, LGBT families in the United States on the foster system. And in fact, queer parents are framed as the thing that's going to alleviate the overburdened foster system that's just dismantling and tearing apart poor families, especially Black families. Um, so I, I grapple with all of those, those questions in the book with the hope of kind of laying a critical groundwork that might be used to forge more meaningful solidarities between queer family politics and other uh, transformative justice projects. Um, I'll stop there, but I did want to say one last thing, uh, and that my talk today was very much inspired by, and the kind of thread that I pulled out, what my advisors used to say to me when I was a grad student. So Renyo brought me back to UC Davis, and I'm, I'm reflecting on that. And I was, um, I'm going to quote Gayatri Gopinath here, who once said to me, can we just stop endlessly diagnosing homonormativity? Can we look for something else? So one of the challenges I put to myself as I was working on this project, um, rather than just kind of tearing apart the, the very act of LGBT parenting, to kind of understand things in far more nuanced ways that didn't rely on some sort of queer straight binary. Thank you so much for those fantastic answers. Um, I actually, let me just check. Okay, we have two minutes. Um, so I will actually just close out rather than asking my own questions, which I think I can do via email now that I have you. Uh, <laughs> um, or actually, uh, okay, so uh, one asker did say um, thank you for your response. Um, and uh, Liat, uh, previous panelists, all of you know, <laughs> um, uh, well, at least in terms of her work, um, says, uh, not, a, not a question, but big thank you, SM. Yes, you're welcome. Um, thank you for your labor, for bringing us together and for such a thought-provoking talk. I loved all the threads running through the symposium, abolition, care, carcerality, perversions, resistances, and art. And I love the way Renyo and Liz ended with a probe into deviance, which is of course a theme of the conference, which seems very timely in relation to the current themes, uh, current times in which this queer virtuality is taking place. Yes, um, yes, uh, thank you. And thank you, Liat, as well, for um, joining us as well as bringing that up. Those, uh, the threads, you know, the conversation I think that we had today, I feel so uh, fantastically um, proud to have shared and experienced uh, with you all. And so I want to thank you three so much for um, 
the questions, the challenges to hope that you provide, but then also um, the, the glimpse into um, possibility and ending with this really fantastic note um, about what future looks like and what it, I think Particularly, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of a challenge that you bring into uh, the conversation as to what future are we building and how, and then also how are we looking at the present in a way that is truly indicative of uh, the potential in queer futures um, or of queer futures or provided by them. Um,